Well, good morning, everybody. If you would, turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, Luke, the fourth chapter. Uh, the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, I always can't consider it a wonderful privilege to have the opportunity to preach at chapel in Southeastern. Also, we are having a conference at the Bush Center on exploring uh, personhood. Uh, this is the third conference that we have hosted. It is, is on challenges uh, to humanity, and I am grateful that we have so many uh, from that conference here this morning in the chapel service with us. So I'm going to continue some of the themes that we've been talking about in the conference as we look at Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. And I want to speak to you this morning about Jesus' encounter in the synagogue at Nazareth. Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out throughout all the surrounding region, and he taught in all their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant who, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, You surely will say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, so do here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. And so all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. I've heard a lot of sermons in my life. A handful of them I didn't like, but I've never had the desire to kill the preacher at the end of a sermon. So what in the world happened between verses 22 and 29? In verse 22, it says, they all spoke well of him. In verse 29, they all tried to throw him off a cliff. What in the world? What's made them change from congregation to lynch mob? I mean, when you read the stories that he told them, they're just stories from the Old Testament, for crying out loud. What in the world is going on? Well, it's difficult for us to understand how the crowd could change. Well, here's the thing to remember. They were an occupied people. They had experienced a succession of waves of invasions. First came the Assyrians. If you remember the book of Jonah, how the Lord sent him to Nineveh to warn the Assyrian capital about the coming judgment, and Jonah didn't want to go. Why did Jonah not want to go? Because he hated the Assyrians. The Assyrians had invaded Israel, and he hated them, and he wanted Nineveh to be destroyed. After the Assyrians came the Babylonians. 
And they didn't just invade, they destroyed Jerusalem and the temple along with it. So what was the mindset of the Hebrews about the Babylonians? Well, take a look at Psalm 137. God, remember those Edomites and remember the ruin of Jerusalem. That day when they yelled out, wreck it, smash it to bits. And you, Babylonians, ravagers, a reward to whoever gets back at you for all you've done to us. Yes, a reward to the one who grabs your babies and, and, and smashes their heads against the rocks. I don't know why we're not using that psalm this, this year in chapel. <clears throat> After the Babylonians came the Persians. After the Persians came the Greeks and now the Romans. You need to understand the level of, of animosity that the Jews held towards the Gentiles. They were looking for a Messiah. All of the intertestamental prayers, they were looking for a military Messiah who would look more like Muhammad than he would look like Jesus. When John the Baptist and Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what they heard was, it's time for a revolution. So let's take a look at the Galilean spring of Jesus's ministry. I'm not the first one to, to talk about how things shifted from a Galilean spring to a Nazarene winter before it's over with here, but I think, I think it does speak to what's going on. Look at verses 14 and 15. It tells us that Jesus has a spirit-filled ministry. It says, and Jesus was led of the Spirit to Galilee. Uh, <clears throat> now, what Luke has done in just verse 14 and 15 is crammed about a year's worth of ministry in just those two verses. And so when you look at uh, uh, Mark's gospel and it tells about just how things were going, this was the beginning of Jesus' public ministry and he's, it's, he is performing all kinds of miracles. So according to verses 14 and 15, Jesus in this time is famous and glorious. Notice what it says. And the news of him went throughout all of the region. The word news there is fame. It's where we get our word for fame. Jesus has gone viral. And it says he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. They are, this, everyone would, would, would speak of Jesus with adoration. This is a period of adulation. Um, I'm old enough to remember Beatlemania. And people just can't quite appreciate what it's like whenever, whenever the Beatles first hit the scene, how people just went crazy about them. Well, here, let's watch this, get the idea of what it's like to be adored. Show the clip there. So verses 14 and 15 tell us Jesus' rock star stage. You say, was it like that? Read Mark's gospel. It talks about wave after wave of thousands of people that came upon him to the point they were crushing him. Uh, it was, it was they, everyone was all talking about the wonderful Jesus. And so this is the springtime of his ministry, the famous period and time of his ministry. So now he enters into Nazareth, and there Jesus is going to tell them his mission statement. Verse 16, so he came to Nazareth as he was brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue. Now, <clears throat> here he is at the worship service of the synagogue uh, on the Sabbath. Now, folks, some services are unforgettable. I mean, 
you think about it, generally when we go to church, we expect just another worship service. Um, here they are at, at a, a, a worship ministry. You know, Jesus grew up in this church. He had attended the worship service many times, but this day, he's the featured speaker. And so as we have this unforgettable service, he then presents to them his prophetic agenda. He asked for the scroll of Isaiah, and turning to Isaiah chapter 61, he reads what his mission statement is. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to do what? First, to preach to the poor. We see where he says, my ministry will be to the poor. And by poor, he doesn't mean just spiritual poverty or material poverty. He's talking about, in many ways, those who are at the bottom of the caste system. He says, I, I, God has called me to minister to the untouchables, to the white trash, to the illegal immigrant. God has called me to minister to them. Uh, not only to the poor, he said he's called me to minister to the brokenhearted. Now, here we have a textual variant uh, in that um, certain uh, manuscripts don't have that expression to the, to the brokenhearted, to bind up to the brokenhearted, but it is in Isaiah 61. And so... Uh, when Jesus read this, uh, it would, we can expect that he actually read this phrase also, to bind or to heal the brokenhearted. And what's the point here, folks? Well, only Christ can keep brokenness from turning into bitterness. God has called me to minister to the brokenhearted. He said, God has called me to minister to the captives. As he says, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now, this is a broad word, the liberty, that refers to forgiveness of sins, to forgiveness of debts, uh, a pardon for a crime. This would be the word that would be used. If someone was rescued or someone was delivered, this is the term that would be used. Malcolm Muggeridge, since we're talking about Russia, Malcolm Muggeridge was a uh, uh, a, a British journalist in the early and middle part of the 20th century. As a young man, he was not just a socialist, he was a communist. And so he jumped at the chance to be a reporter in Stalin's Russia. But his experience in Russia in general, and in Ukraine in particular, cured him of his communism. Because uh, he saw what communism really looked like. And so, as he is the editor of Punch magazine and a known and well-known journalist, it caused no small stir when in the 1940s he converted to Christianity. And he wrote a book explaining, talking about his conversion experience and talking about the Russian Revolution of 1917, where Russia uh, overthrew the czars uh, and then what did they get? They got the Bolsheviks, the communists. They, they, it, it went from bad to worse. And he said, in other freedoms, once won, they soon turn into new servitude. Jesus Christ is the only liberator whose liberation lasts forever. Jesus has called, Jesus says, I have been called to set the captives truly free. And so he's ministering to the, the poor, to the brokenhearted, to the captives, and then he said God has called him to minister to the blind, as he says again, and to, <clears throat> to give the recovery of sight to the blind. Not just uh, physical blindness, uh, also spiritual blindness, in other words, his point is this, no one is going to be outside of the reach of Jesus' gospel. Now, it is interesting to note what he didn't say, because he stopped reading right there. And if you read on in Isaiah 61, he says the next thing is to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. Well, that's not his first 
appearing. That'll be when he returns the second time. And so we have where Jesus attends the worship service, he gives everyone his mission statement, and now we have this electric moment. Look at verse 20. It says in verse 20, he closed the book, gave it to the attendant, sat down, and what? And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. In other words, no one is asleep that day. No one is distracted. No one's reading their smartphone. They are all paying attention to him at that moment. In verse 21, he reveals to them who he really is. As he says to them, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, what he's saying is, the one prophesied in Isaiah 61, I am here. And so he reveals to them who he really is, but they're all still completely without a clue. Look at verse 22. It says, and they all spoke well of him, and they marveled at his Uh, at the words that proceeded out of his mouth. In other words, so far, so good. They think he's great. Uh, My roommate in college, uh, my first two years uh, that I was in college, my roommate was this wonderful uh, Japanese Christian gentleman. Um, Nabamasa Tajima uh, was his name. Uh, We called him Nabi. Uh, He, after he graduated from Tennessee Temple, he went back to Japan where he served his entire life as a church planter uh, and as a pastor. He went home to be with the Lord last year. And so I just think of Nabi with nothing but fond memories. But Nabi was just one of the most gracious polite, kindest persons you'd ever want to meet. And I can remember in the dorm one day, in particular, a bunch of us guys were in the dorm. We were all cutting up and we were acting, you know, like guys in a dorm do. And somebody said something particularly funny. I mean, it was a great joke. And we're all just laughing as hard as we can. And I look over, Nobby's laughing. And I said, Nobby, did you get the joke? And he said, no, but he just kept right on laughing. (laughs) You know, I've, I've been in services where they come up, Pastor, that was a wonderful sermon. Did you understand what I was talking about? No, but it was beautiful. (laughs) Notice, they are without a clue. It says they all speak well of him and they marvel at his words. But Luke, just to make sure that we know that they don't get it, they all look at each other and say, is this not Joseph's son? Well, actually, no. They don't get it. So things take a very dramatic, unexpected turn at this moment. Jesus says a very surprising proverb. You will surely say to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have done and we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. In other words, Uh, You say it, I want to see it, prove it. And he then gives them another proverb, verse 24, where he says, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. In other words, he's warning them that familiarity breeds contempt. Evidently, we humans, no matter how beautiful, how wonderful, how sacred or how glorious something is, we have the ability to take it for granted. And so he then gives a stinging observation. Look at verse 25. But I tell you truly, there were a lot of widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a famine in the land. None of them, to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. There were a lot of lepers in Israel at the time of Elijah, Elisha the prophet, but none, to none of them, uh, none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. What is the point that he's making here? Well, here's the thing to realize. The widow in Sidon, that's not in the promised land. She's a Gentile. These were the people who were at war with 
Israel. And only she is the one who received the miracle of the widow's cruise of oil. And Naaman the Syrian, Syria was besieging Israel. They were the enemies of Israel. And yet only Naaman was healed. Here's the point that he's making. None of the needy in Israel received anything. What he's telling them is this. Those whom you hate, those whom you loathe, those whom you despise, spiritually speaking, they're in better shape than you are. He's telling them that they are worse off spiritually than the Gentiles and pagans around them. Evidently, it is easier to repent of sin than it is to repent of righteousness. Now, we started with the Galilean spring. Now we're going to see the Nazarene winter. Verse 28, So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Now, they are at a worship service. And they are worshipers in a house of worship. And the whole time, their hearts are filled with murder. That's hard to understand. Back 20 years ago, when we started doing the Oxford study tour, I loved it. Love still, still love going. One of the cool things is going to C.S. Lewis's house and finding all things about C.S. Lewis. 20 years ago, I was at Regent's Park. Dr. Bob Stewart of New Orleans was there, and uh, we were teaching a class on C.S. Lewis. And wouldn't you know it, the C.S. Lewis Society was meeting in Oxford at that time, and the president of the C.S. Lewis Institute, Tom Terrence, was in Oxford. So Bob Stewart contacted him, and he agreed to speak to my class. How cool is that? And so Tom Terrence comes to speak, uh, and as he stands up, he is this elderly, dignified, tall, uh, southern gentleman. And he spoke with that cultured southern uh, 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 gentleman's voice. And as he began to speak, what he said was nothing that the students expected to hear. Because what he started with was this. Young people, when I was your age, I was a terrorist. And I was part of a terrorist organization. I was a hitman for the Ku Klux Klan. And I conducted a number of bombings of various places, churches, and synagogues in the 1960s. He said, when the civil rights movement had its start, I was reading everything I could from the John Birch Society. And I was convinced, like many of my fellow Southerners, I was convinced that the uh, civil rights movement was a communist plot to destabilize and overthrow our society, our culture, and our government. I was thoroughly convinced, he said, that Martin Luther King was a communist agent. And I believed it was my duty as a Christian uh, soldier for the Lord to do everything I can to stop desegregation and, inter and integration. And so he talked about how he did terrible things. And he and an accomplice were assigned by the Mississippi Ku Klux Klan. Uh, there was a Jewish rabbi in Meridian, Mississippi, who was taking a stand for the civil rights movement and arguing that uh, the Jim Crow laws against blacks uh, should be overthrown. Uh, and so he was targeted. They wanted his home bombed. And so Tom Terrence and his accomplice had 
put together the bomb, and they were going to his house in the middle of the night to blow up him and his family. Well, <clears throat> the police were waiting. And when Tom stepped out of the car and was walking across the front yard with the bomb, they all said, freeze, stop. He ran, got back in the car. They had a big car chase, big shootout. Uh, his accomplice was killed instantly. Whenever the car crashed, he got out of his car. He had a submachine gun and he shot one of the policemen four times, severely wounding him. And Tom Terrence that night was severely wounded himself and really thought he was going to die. But he didn't. He survived, he was tried, and he was convicted for 30 years. Uh, his sentence was 30 years in the Mississippi State Penitentiary. That was in 1968. In 1969, he and two others, in inmates, escaped from the Mississippi State Prison. And for three days, the entire state was in a manhunt trying to find those three escapees. They found them. There was another shootout, and one of, his three, one of the three inmates was shot and killed along with uh, but Tom. This time was taken back to the prison. This time, it's solitary confinement. And so for day after day, week after week, month after month, he's in solitary confinement, and he picks up a Bible and starts reading it. And he said, when he got to the Sermon on the Mount, suddenly it became so painfully aware to him that whatever he was didn't resemble the Sermon on the Mount. And he said it, there in that cell, as I read the Gospels, it became came clear to me. Here I thought I was a soldier for the Lord, but I was God's enemy. And there in that cell in solitary confinement, he got on his knees and God gloriously saved him. Bring up the next slide there. There's a wonderful book that he has now published called Consumed by Hate, Redeemed by Love, in which he tells that story about how God penetrated the hatred and murder that was in his heart. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing I want you to get. The whole time that he was with the Ku Klux Klan, he was the mem a member of a significant Southern Baptist church. And in fact, his pastor uh, would go on to become one of the presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention. His accomplice was a woman who graduated from a Baptist college. And she was teaching fifth grade uh, middle school and was a member of a Southern Baptist church in which she sang in the choir. And so the thing to realize, folks, as we see this, is that their true colors were revealed in this moment. What am I trying to say? What am I trying to get at? When we hear voices uh, calling for violence and radical action, and we're surprised to find out it's within our own community that some of these voices are calling from within the evangelical community calling for violence, for actions. Folks, this is not our first rodeo. The four Gospels already tell us how we are to respond to this. Keep this in mind. Keep this chapter in mind all through this year, no matter what anyone says or calls for, even if it comes from within the evangelical community. Christ has called us to something higher and better. Notice, I'll close on this, how Christ's sovereign power is revealed. In verse 30, they want to take him up onto a cliff and throw him off of it. And as they proceed to do this, it says, verse 30, then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. This should give us insight 
to what Jesus could have done if he had so decided to avoid the cross. When Jesus was arrested, when he was tried, when he was tortured and then crucified, all during that time, the sovereign Lord was letting humanity do that to him. At any moment he so had chosen or wanted to, he could have said, that's enough. Stop. I'm out of here. Everything he did for us, he did for us willingly. When we were unlovable, Christ loved us. When we were at our worst, Christ died for us. When we were God's enemies, Christ became our reconciliation. Father in heaven, I pray that that would always be the way we would look, the direction we would point to. Lord, we, we are st strangers and pilgrims. We are exiles in this present age. Teach us how we are to relate to matters of government and of state. And Lord, when our passions are inflamed and we're angry, help us to remember the way of Christ. Lord, help us to see him. And so Lord, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and amen.